So um, I'm the CEO of Splash Damage. And today my company is working on Batman Arkham Origins with Warner Brothers and Extraction, a free-to-play shooter. But I'm not here to do a sales pitch. In fact, I'm only going to talk about the first seven years of my company. I'm here to talk about happiness, but first I'm going to talk about suffering. I believe that suffering is caused predominantly in our games industry by the collapse of teams. When small indie developers lose their life savings, when they lose their dreams on their second or third title, when medium-sized AAA developers crash and burn, and we lose those houses and supercar collections that we've built up, and when large-scale publishing teams collapse sending their staff home to tell their husbands and their kids that they're not going to be paying the mortgage this month. This stuff is serious for the people in the industry, but gamers get massively frustrated too. Their dreams are shattered when sequels don't come out, when the Kickstarters they invest in don't get completed. And I know, as a developer today, that digital distribution and free-to-play seem like the great disruptors in our industry. We know for certain that they're impacting physical manufacturing, distribution, retail, those little boxes you see in stores that generate credit card receipts. But is it really new? And if it isn't really new, is there anything we can learn from the past to increase the success of teams in the future. And this became a unique obsession for me. My company is 12 years old this year. We've worked on some of the world's biggest IPs like Wolfenstein and Doom and Quake. And we've been lucky to have worldwide number one hits multiple times. But we've had shocking, catastrophic internal disasters that I'm going to tell you about today. Uh, so embarrassingly, I feel a little bit mischievous. I'm going to try and resist, resist it. <laughs> the, um, but what I discovered, what I think I've discovered, is that the answer is simple, almost profoundly simple. It might, you know, in an industry like ours today, which is full of complexity, by the, be the simplest idea in games. Back when I was uh, 16, I disappointed my parents being expelled from school for... Um, unofficial, unauthorized access of the school computer system, and as they called it, inauthentic manufacturing of raffle tickets, which I think was, um, was deeply unfair. But my passion for computers started then. It was two or three years later before I went bankrupt, disappointing my parents for the second time. At 20, though, with my mail order PC business in tatters and bailiff storming through the door of the headquarters, the bedroom in my mum's council flat, um, I discovered that really games was for me, computers were for me. 20 years ago, almost today, I was driving around the streets here in London fixing PCs in what I think was a salubrious job. It took me to places like the serious fraud office where I spent all night blowing dust out of the fan of a server, or uh, MI5 secret service, I've changed toner cartridges there. Uh, finally, I think my biggest claim to fame is that at 10 Downing Street, I swapped a hard disk. How cool is that? I got fired when they discovered I got the job by reading a book on upgrading and repairing PCs on the trains of the interview. And that really is a true story. But when I got home, I found kind of respite in the fact that my little BBS, what was called then a bulletin board system, had people dialing into it and downloading games. Back then, we had shareware, and I was one of the guys providing Wolfenstein and Doom to fans, as an amateur, completely for free. And back then, it was thought to be the great disruptor, the end of retail. Apps and utilities and games would be freely distributed as shareware and freeware. Of course, the 90s saw the rise of id and Epic and Valve and Blizzard and Bioware, and none of that came true. None of the doom-mongering came true. I started my company seven or eight years later with my co-founder, Richard Jolly, who's in the audience. And we've had a great time over that period, but we've seen some scary times too. And over that period, I've, lent for, I've learned, I think, from some of the, the best leaders in industry. I read old school stuff by the dark masters, people like J. Paul Getty and his $2 billion industry, the richest man in the 60s. People like Jack Welch, the head of General Electric. And, you know, nicer, cooler people today, like, Simon uh, Sinek, people like David Novak, who runs Yum. Of course, Yum deliver all of Pizza Hut and KFC to every developer and gamer worldwide, 1.4 million employees. And even Tony Shea at Zappos.com, a company that's gone from bankruptcy 
to a billion dollars turnover in eight or so short years and a billion dollar exit with Amazon, despite the fact that they set happiness as the primary focus of their company for their staff and of course for their customers. I believe that these great business thinkers, my thesis is that this all results in a basic simple triplet three simple ideas, and it goes back two and a half thousand years to Aristotle. Now, Aristotle had a theory on rhetoric, which most people think of as being pretty negative. My wife says, you're just being rhetorical, or in fact, my staff say that's a rhetorical question whenever I say something to them. But in actual fact, rhetoric isn't that negative. Rhetoric, when you think about it, is ethos, using credibility, you know, to show that you know what you're talking about pathos, creating passion in the audience that you're talking to, and logos, having logic and sound reasoning for the things that you do. In 1998, when Posi Psychology started, the psychological stream that's focused on happiness, they found over the years that they researched three or four things that contributed most significantly to happiness. And oddly, those three things were a perception of purpose, the sense that you're credible, something bigger than you, a sense of progress, of having uh, advancement of growth, a feeling that you can develop passion for what you do, not just a job, not just a career, but feeling that you're in your calling. And also, posi psychologists, posit, posi psychologists, posit, that having a sense of control over your destiny is important, that the basis of your future is not determined, not predetermined, that you have a sense of, in essence, logic, a sound basis for your existence. And when you put that together with connectedness, the depth and quantity of relationships that you have with other people, they found that people found happiness. It's a really interesting concept. Two really amazing thinkers on this subject about how you bring people with you using that process are Pat Lencioni, one of the best thinkers on facilitation. He takes huge business exec groups off to golf clubs all the time. And another guy called Simon, Simon Sinek, who's more of a kind of blue collar thinker who thinks about marketing messages. And they both came back with exactly the same conclusion, that three simple questions, if answered and appraised honestly, can make a massive difference to the success of a team. And all I care about is the survival of the team because it's in the absence of that suffering that comes from their collapse that we have happiness in game development. So I'm gonna start with the first of these, and it's called what? In fact, the three questions are, why do we exist, how do we behave, and what do we do? And they seem pretty obvious, glib almost. What do we do? We make games, sometimes we make money. That's pretty cool, it's easy, right? When I started thinking about this more seriously and why splash damage exists and why we haven't gone bust, I had to think about what we'd done in the past. I had to think about the opportunities we'd taken and the ones that we'd turned down. Over the years, we've worked on successors to Wolfenstein and Doom and Quake and they were all number one hits, and they all did pretty well on a Metacritic score. But I know that over that period of time, we had disasters too. Back in 2003, just as we were getting ready to ship Wolfenstein Enemy Territory, our very, very uh, first commercial game, I had, uh, uh, I think we were working on E3, either E3 or trying to get to the cabinet war rooms here in London for a big press event, and my left lung collapsed just as I was ordering Chinese food which I think is suspicious, but I've not researched that. Nevertheless, I ended up in hospital a couple of hours later, and the doctor said, don't worry, you're not going to die unless your fingers go blue and your lips go blue. So I really wasn't concerned at all in majors, uh, as, I'm not kidding, the woman on my left died, and then the guy on my right died, and I ended up the only person alive in a ward, in majors, attached to intensive care, frankly shitting myself. When the nurse came running in, checked my fingertips and checked my lips, <laughs> and then shouted for a crew who came running in and gave me an injection, I was convinced I was dying. And I told her so, and she said, no, you're just scared. Your lips are shivering. We're giving you a sedative. I felt like an idiot. I fell asleep really, really fast, which they said was fainting. I think I just fell asleep really quickly. The next day, though, I woke up in the cardiothoracic ward, which is a ward full of people in their 70s, 80s, and 90s, because I'm the only idiot in Bromley who had a problem with his lungs. The guy opposite me, he had a pretty sad story to tell, though. He'd retired. He was a lorry driver, I think delivering soft drinks around the UK, and he'd done it his entire life. Somehow, over the course of his life, he'd saved 60,000 pounds, his entire life savings, and he invested them, invested them in a British games publisher and lost the lot. He'd had a heart attack 
and everybody around his bed was crying and upset and worried about him. He wasn't really that concerned when I chatted to him that evening, but it reminded me, you know, sometimes we get so distracted by ARPUs and ARPDOWs and CCUs and decay curves and attach rates, and we forget that really we're here to create happiness for our fans and happiness for shareholders. It's not that complicated. Business is a black box. If you really want to know about business, you stick cash in one end and you crank a handle and you make people happy and more money comes out the other end. And if that's what's happening, you don't suck. But if it isn't what's happening, find somebody who knows how to make more money come out of the other end and do a different part of the job. I don't do finance. I hired a finance guy years ago. What we realized is that of course you have to make fans happy and of course you have to make money, but the only key performance indicator when you're a small indie developer, when you're a medium-sized company, in fact, when you're a publishing team and you're looking at how much you've spent and how much you're going to make is to make more than you spend. The KPI is whether that balance is going up or whether it's going down. It's kind of the cornerstone to survival, but it's also the least important of the three, oddly. How we behave then becomes really important. When I talk about how we behave, it's because I've learned that if you think of a, a person's character as being their destiny, if you think of the way that a person acts as kind of being a determinant of whether they're gonna be successful in the future or not, and we all know what that means, then culture for a company is its destiny. Those values, whether you define them or not, that your founders hold, that your staff hold, they're the things that are going to dictate your future and whether it's successful or not. Some of those values are really good. If you sample your top staff, I'm sure they'll come back with the same answers that mine did. Humility, integrity, you know, getting things done, honesty. Those things are really, really important. But sometimes they come back with unique things that surprise you. For my team, freedom and mastery are absolutely prized above all other values. And I didn't really understand why. And then I got to thinking, you know, back in 2007, just as we were shipping enemy territory quake wars for the PC, I realized, of course, we were gonna have a number one. I was an arrogant cock. But one of the things I'd also developed was a really kind of dictatorial, horrible, autocratic management style that involved micromanaging every single person in the building. And as a result, I'd become a bottleneck. And my co-founder, Richard, who sat at the back, was exactly the same. His feedback for artists who weren't doing well was to say, that's a bit wank. You can imagine how well respected we were as a management team. Three months later, after getting the number one that we hoped for, two or three of my senior managers walked out, started a spin-off, and stole our next contract. You can imagine I was flabbergasted. I didn't give them permission. I didn't tell them to do it. I found refuge in a fantastic book by Jim Collins. This book, good to great, and built to last. Everybody's read them, they're amazing, but we all take different messages from them when we read books like that. For me, what I learned was that it was more important to get the right people on the bus before I figured out where I was going to take it. That is to say, to get really cool, masterful people on the team and then give them the freedom to figure out where we were going. I've since found it incredibly easy to find and hire people that are better than me. It was a shocking revelation how easy that turned out to be. What I did realize, though, is that if that lesson was so powerful, there might be something else I could learn, too. I feel like how we behave is critical to the success of a company. I grew up in absolute awe of John Carmack and id Software. We played their games. Richard Jolly and I were in enemy teams. It's how we became friends by competing. We cooperated when we made a mod using Quake 3 Arena in the back of the day. We collaborated when we did TV show work and presented a TV show uh, to Australasia in the early days of eSports. But what I realize now when I think about it is that if there was one calculator left on the planet and it was the only working piece of technology, Carmack would be sat in front of it trying to make it render better. That's where he'd be. And we all know it. And that's why he's at Oculus today. So this led me to the biggest question of them all. Pat Lencioni, Simon Sinek, people like Daniel Pink who wrote the book on Drive, even Frederick Hertzberg with his theories on human motivation, talks about purpose as being the single biggest and most important thing. As somebody uniquely focused on purpose, Pat Lencioni said that it should be ideological, it should be grandiose. We think our purpose is to make money, but making money is really the incidental benefit of success at doing what it is that we believe really well and convincing other people to follow us. 
as a result, when we established what our purpose was, we were happy to think about in what way we're going to try and make the world a little bit better. I mean, really, what we do in simple terms is create a kind of value proposition, and someone interacts with it, and their life gets slightly better. It's not necessarily transformational. It may just be in niche, tiny ways, but that's why we're here. So if you ask yourself that question, why do you exist? And then you ask yourself the question again and again and again. And just before you get to, to change the world, you choose the thing below. That's how you figure out why you're here. Oddly, we realized part of the reason why we'd survived, based entirely really on luck and fluke, is because 12 years beforehand, Richard Arnout and I had sat in front of a whiteboard because the press had asked us a really tough question. Why did you start splash damage? What's it for? And we had no effing clue. We just knew that we were mates. We liked going online and shooting each other in the face. So we wrote a line on a whiteboard that said, we'll shamelessly pursue a claim from press and fans, hopefully at the same time, whilst ensuring staff can pay their rent. 12 years later, our staff have had their rent paid, their salaries paid every month without fail, and it's never been late. Of course, my salary and Richard's and Arnout's has been late many times. But just writing that purpose on a whiteboard kind of made it come true. It made a difference. It really shocked us. Today, when I think about our purpose, our purpose is different. Our purpose is still to make core multiplayer combat games, but that isn't the reason why we exist. We discovered that we became friends through comp competition cooperation. And that friendship has led to a kind of manifesto, a better understanding of why we're here. We believe that the depth and quantity of friendships is best increased when we're collaborating and competing with each other. And we and our team value freedom and mastery above all other values, not just for our staff, but for fans too. And that dictates the way that we create games. What we make is almost incidental. It's almost incidental that we make blockbuster multiplayer combat games. I think Rich and Arnout and I and a bunch of the guys at the office would have fun making board games or card games, devising sports. Geez, we have competed with each other in every possible way. You, well, not every way, but in most ways that you can imagine over the years. We're not a company that's great at bringing cinema experiences to people. We're not here to, hu to tell huge stories. What we love doing is creating an environment where players can generate stories for themselves and they can relate those to other people. Some of the best companies in the world, some of the most progressive companies in the world, companies like Southwest Airlines with analysts telling people that their share price should be going up this week. People like Zappos.com who made happiness the future of their company, they've achieved incredible success by changing their focus from share price and shareholder value what we now believe to have caused the global meltdown to culture instead, because they believe that getting everybody aligned, everybody rowing in the same direction is the most important thing that you can do. I know when you think about happiness, you're thinking in this audience, of course, about money and power and wealth and partners, but perhaps work-life balance too and spending more time with the kids and spending more time with the family. And that kind of happiness isn't the thing that I'm here to preach about. In fact, I'm not really even preaching. This is not dogma. I'm not saying this is true. I just hope maybe you find something useful. You have the opportunity to go back to your offices, to go back to your small teams, to go back to your publishing companies, and identify the core real purpose for why your company or your organization or your small indie team exists. You have the opportunity to talk to people, the founders, the top staff, about their values and why it is that that makes them successful and try and clone those values in the other staff, try and orient new people that come on board to achieve and have those same values too. You have the opportunity when you think about what you make to change strategy constantly. There's nothing wrong with that. Marketing, technology, finance, there's KPIs for all of them. They all make us feel good. But minimizing politics, minimizing confusion, lowering staff turnover results in consistency of people and consistency of process. When our games have sucked, it's because we've had new teams. When our games have been good, it's because we've had teams for long periods of time. 12 years ago, when I wrote that whiteboard with Richard and Arnout, and I wrote those two things down, and I said the shameless pursuit of critical acclaim, and we said whilst ensuring staff can pay rent, I didn't know it would come true. I wish I had because I would have written another thing on that whiteboard. You know, okay, I would have scrubbed the thing out and written something completely different. I would have said, we're here to create happiness for our staff first. We're here to create happiness for our fans second, and then for our partners equally too. 
And that's our strategy. It's not the strategy, it's not the strategy, it's not a strategy, it's our only strategy. And I hope you guys too will consider creating happiness as a strategy for your teams. Thank you very much.